Okay, well, thank you guys for joining us live for the MVP event. We will tell you how do we build successful MVP for one of our clients, which is called Reported. That's a startup. And also we'll talk about some important considerations that will help you make your MVP better. And on the call, we have our all-star team, uh, two people, Aram Malkamov, CEO and founder of CrowdLinker, and Fiona Holler, she's our director of product. Thank you all for joining. We are going to start with a question to either Aram or Fiona. What do people and founders quite commonly misunderstand about MVPs from your experience? Yeah, good question. Um, so over the last few years, we've built about 50, 60, 50 to 60 digital products in different industries and verticals. And the most common thing that still to this date, a lot of um, product people and founders uh, that we work with um, struggle is identifying what is an MVP. So I'm sure you know this, MVP stands for minimal viable product. I, I like to look at it in another way. It's, I would call it a minimal marketable product. What is that product that you need to build that can be marketable to others? Or another way is minimal viable job. So a minimal viable job, what is that one job to be done that your product needs to deliver? And so um, our learnings to date tell us that a lot of people still struggle really focusing in and owning and what is that one purpose or one feature that is going to be solving a problem to your users that they can't get elsewhere? And what is that competitive advantage or unfair advantage that you're going to have in that MVP that is going to incentivize those specific users to use your app and ideally pay you for that app? And uh, from an MVP standpoint, I think success looks like somebody paying for your product at the end of the day, somebody giving you a financial commitment of sorts to actually uh, confirming that this pain is real, uh, that you've identified in this, in this solution that you've uh, launched. Do you yeah, want anything to, to add? Yeah, um, I agree with everything Rome said, obviously. Um, I mean, an MVP, it's traditionally part of a lean methodology, and it's really to improve the business process and eliminate waste. Um, and it's, in essence, it's supposed to try and make building a product or feature easier, not harder. Um, I find that the, there's a massive range of expectations around and definition of what an MVP is. Um, some people believe it's a subpar version of a product and to the extreme that an MVP needs to be perfect and should be shippable to market. Um, it really should just have enough features to gather validated learning about the product um, and so that you can build on it um, for further development or, or gain the capital investment that you were hoping to get out of that product. What is the purpose of an MVP? <clears throat> because it varies quite a lot when we talk to, not only if we talk to a look at startups or enterprise, but like even if within a startup or enterprise, everybody has a different definition or different purpose of what it is. How do you look at that? Yeah, um, I mean, with an MVP, basically you're looking for what's the problem to be solved, um, whether it is a, a hole in the market that you're trying to build a brand new startup feature or product around, or if it's in an enterprise and you're trying to, you know, build on some customer feedback and um, actually build a new uh, feature or to an existing product. Um, basically, what you're trying to do is answer and analyze what is the problem and how can we quickly test how we might be able to solve that problem. It really is just about um, a testing tool um, so that you can iterate um, on that and um, eventually solve the problem for the end users and, and be able to um, you know, build a product that's going to work for, for your users. Just to add on that, a lot of the customers that we work with, um, when they ask us to help us build an MVP, their business goals are twofold, maybe sometimes even more, but one primarily is I needed an MVP to go test something uh, so that I could demonstrate to investors that um, I have I have identified an issue where I have some product market fit around potentially that I could go and raise money against. That's typically the one most commonly that you know we come across. Um, the second one is obviously um, I've spoken to enough people uh, in, in the, in my customer development phase, um, that have identified a specific series or, you know, 
group of problems that I want to now go and try to create a prototype of sorts around or something that I could demonstrate to them that I'm trying to solve for. So it kind of really depends, you know, if you have the need to go and get funding, uh, then MVP is typically the business reason why you should try to take a solution to market to validate the need that exists so that you could get funding around to continue your further development for. And the case we're going to break down today, Aram reported, their goal was to validate their uh, concept. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have the, I mean, their priority wasn't around um, the funding side. It was more around, I need to go and actually create something that somebody can use so I could demonstrate to them what I'm trying to solve. And so after uh, spending about a month, month and a half of building the MVP, um, they then took this product and they went to their target demographic in order to get them to use it, test it, give feedback so that we could further iterate on it. Let's talk about and report it since we are on, to, on this topic. So if you guys don't know, uh, so what is reported? It's a little, it's a mobile app that gives users a way to report issues that they see around them. Things like roadkill, live wires, broken elevators. And so they connect concerned citizens, if you will, with the right authority to fix them. How do we start with that MVP process with them around? What was the whole initial conversation? So. Um... In this specific situation, they actually spent time coming to us with some sort of problem validation that they created a hypothesis around. And it helped us a bit because they already put some basic two screen wireframe in uh, that we were able to kind of reference and see that where their vision is of the product. Um, from that point, um, what we needed to go through is a series of exercises where we tried to identify their understanding of what those wireframes mean, uh, writing out something called a product requirements document, which is a breakout of different kinds of features and user stories around that. And then basically we interpreted what they're telling us. And then we came back to them saying, is this your understanding of what the product is going to be solving? And then we would go through, um, a series of either descoping exercise or reclassification exercises around what are the things that we want to actually build in the MVP versus put towards a future roadmap. Mm -hmm. Fiona, from your perspective, what do you need to know before you actually start building an MVP? And maybe you could speak from a, your perspective of a large, larger company than, than a startup, like a mid-size or enterprise. Like what are some of the things you need to have in place to, be, to begin the process? Right. Um, so there's two main things that you need to have before you start actually building an MVP. Um, the first is being able to define the problem. And, and these apply to startups or large enterprise. Um, you need to understand what the pain points are. What are you trying to solve for? That's your basic, um, your, your problem statement. Um, the second is some data, um, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. If you're trying to solve for a problem where the product doesn't exist, um, where there isn't a market, a product on the market for this, you can rely heavily on things like user interviews or surveys, um, trying to draw analysis from products in other industries. If you're building um, on a product that exists, which is primarily the case in large enterprise, um, you can use those other tools, but you can also then layer in additional user feedback, data analytics. Um, and then once you have that sort of research piece and you've had your problem and it's clearly defined, um, from there, you can start to formulate what the MVP might include. Um, and you could go into a phase of discovery where you start working with your stakeholders um, and to try and really prioritize what needs to be included in an MVP and everybody can get aligned on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I would... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Wrong. No, go ahead gonna, and I'll, I'll add it later. I was going to say that with any kind of product these days... Um, we, we typically, uh, most commonly, there's a framework called uh, that we short form DVF. So desirability, viability, feasibility. So what that stands for is like, A, is your product desirable? Is there a real need in the market? V, is it viable? Can we actually build something? And from like a feasibility standpoint, it's like, uh, it's a mix between the technical side and like the problem side. Like, is this like a relatable thing to actually solve for? Um, and so the hardest part, in my opinion, of building any product, like technology is quite a commodity these days. So you could always use many off-the-shelf solutions. There's no-code solutions or whatnot. 
Um, but it's figuring out whether or not your product is desirable enough to actually build a solution around. And that's typically the one that a lot of people skip over because when they think, um, when they come in, you know, to a conversation with us, I need to build an MVP. Here's what I've already thought. We would then say, okay, what did you do to validate this? Um, and so sometimes it's like, well, I didn't, this is a thing that I see that is a problem. And so, you know, we frequently come across this innovator's dilemma problem where founder or, you know, founding team really strongly believe that the solution is needed, but they didn't actually go and speak to anybody. And so with any MVP, whether you build it for a startup, because that's pretty important, you know, you need to do that as a startup, but even for an enterprise, it's always going and speaking to your customers. So you have to figure out where do I find them? How do I access them? What you know, from like a scalability perspective, how effectively can I always reach those people? Where do they live? Where do they reside? How do I find them online? And all these types of things that you need to consider. And then once you find where they are, it's then, you know, figuring out, okay, like how do I approach them? What questions do I need to ask? I know this is all part of customer development. And you basically are asking these questions to figure out, okay, um, based on these questions that I'm, I'm going to be answer, asking them and the response I get, where are the common, where are the common traits? And you go through, you know, some sense making to see what are the main problems that these people are telling me? Is that problem enough to solve? And then it's like, okay, is the market big enough? Is there a total addressable market for this that, you know, I could go for and, and, and see if I could build a whole business around it or product around it. Yeah, we spoke with uh, we spoke with startups. We spoke we spoke with enterprise people, and time and time again, this point comes up where people are scared to get out of the building and actually talk to customers. Mm -hmm. That's like a very common thing. It doesn't matter. Like we had we had a product director of product, I think, in the bank who was talking. He did, was doing a workshop, and there was this point where he's like, "Well, you have a credit card now. Go talk to the customers," and nobody really wanted to do it. They literally froze in their seats. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a barrier to, to kind of like overcome and maybe having some external help in that sense could be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good process to build in your product and design teams as something that you do regularly where you have to go out and talk to your users um, for a number of reasons. It gets valuable feedback, but it also makes you more comfortable in, in that process and in having those conversations with um, your users. Um, this is something that I've done in a past role you know, walking around Union Station, downtown Toronto, talking to random people waiting for a train, uncomfortable, but you get a lot of information back and you get a lot of experience in talking to your customers. Let's talk about reported, Aram. I know we, when the guys reached out to us, they already did good homework. Like it was actually better than a lot of times other startups that come to us. What did they, did they do for, to validate their problem how did we confirm that they actually understood it before we started? Um, it's a good question. Um, so they had access to um, people in the industry, uh, specifically organizations within uh, building associations, within the government level uh, in, in, in their country that they spoke to and they learned that some of these intake uh, software doesn't exist. So there was no way for them to actually capture this information at uh, an efficient level. And so they, they had that, in my opinion, a bit of an unfair advantage because they had access to those people in those roles, like as potential user base uh, that they could go to. And so they asked, they went through like a, a, a bit of a discovery process with them to see where, what tools, if any, that exist uh, that allows them to do these things currently, if any. And then they learned, you know, pretty quickly that some of these organizations, like very various uh, building management companies don't have any of these type of solutions. It's very manual. They use basically like a series of pencil paper type of like, give me comments on things that we should improve on in our buildings. Um, so not very scalable, not digital very hard to like extract things I know from a, a larger automatic kind of process standpoint. And so from that, they kind of went and created like a very, very basic chicken scratch kind of like um, 
a wireframe for us that led us to think through in terms of, okay, how do we achieve the ability to capture something that a person sees in three clicks or less so that they could report it to the right person within their building, within their community, within their government or whatnot, so that Sorry, guys, I'm having some issues with my mic and I wasn't sure if it's you or um, or it's me. Um, keep, go- keep talking, guys. Give me a minute. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll reconnect uh, my, uh, my uh, audio because I, I just lost it for a sec. We had a bit of a leg up, but the challenge with any of those enterprise organizations or government bodies is that they still want to see something that they could play around with, that they could, you know, click through, that they could test out very hard to win over an enterprise, um, organization or government, uh, without something more than just like a, you know, a wireframe or a clickable prototype. We actually had to go and act and build an MVP within a few weeks, uh, that they could then use to demonstrate, um, back to them as like some sort of proof of concept. That proof of concept now led to getting them feedback and um, uh, future maybe uh, features that we need to now incorporate uh, in order to build out additional functionality into the roadmap. But it's very different, I would say, between an enterprise uh, or a startup. Depending on who your user base is, you have to act accordingly in terms of how you propose uh, the, fee- the, f- the the solution to them. Some people in the startup world for an MVP, it's like, okay, I could live, I could get through a clickable prototype, but some in the enterprise realm need something a bit more sophisticated that they could actually pass along, test out. So ultimately we decided that we're gonna go and actually build out something very quickly so that we could present it back to that target market. So you got aligned um, you got aligned on the fact that, look, the MVP is going to look like this. It's not going to be a $5 million fully built application as an example. Yeah, for sure. Like the product manager on the team was very frugal. Let's put it that way. was very frugal around their um, large ideas that they wanted to have. And so through a series of exercises um, that we went through with the client, it was more descoping than adding anything into scope. And so that, if your stakeholders are obviously uh, open-minded and you have a small committee that you're working with without less influence coming in from the outside, and this is, I think, an important success factor for any MVP, um, going through that process with them, it's we want to make uh, more with less. And so an MVP um, is successful based on how much you could do with as little as possible that solves the job to be done. Um, and oftentimes you could get quite um, overwhelmed with different types of ideas or initiatives that are thrown at you. But as a product manager, you really should be thinking about, okay, like if I throw out everything else, what is this what is this really going to look like? What, how can I minimize the amount of click-throughs, the amount of actions uh, for that user so that they just get what they want uh, coming into that application and then they could leave feeling happy that, that they've completed something? Right. How do we, uh, Piona, this is for you. What do we do uh, in, um, when you have more stakeholders, maybe more than we had with reported, to keep MVP on track, to keep it on budget. So not to avoid overbuilding it because we often hear these stories of, oh, there's an MVP in the bank, quote unquote, but actually costs $5 million. So like think crazy things like that. Like, what do you actually do? How do you talk to them or meet with them to actually make sure that, hey, this is, this is it and we're not gonna go beyond that? Yeah, that's tough. Um, and I think in general, this is why enterprise and and large organizations are pretty crap at building MVPs. Um, I think the first way um, to kind of manage the project is to manage expectations. Um, That I find that I constantly have to remind stakeholders what is included in in the MVP, what is the purpose of the MVP and keep that front and center. 
Um, so the communication is key, and, and this takes form in a multitude of ways. Um, we have written communication in terms of what the objective is and what the deliverables are. Um, and everyone involved in the process, stakeholders, designers, engineers, they all need to be on the same page in line on what is going to be shipped, what is going to be deliver delivered as part of that MVP. Um, the second part of that is that MVPs are fun, they're exciting time, it means you're trying something new. Um, and people get really excited about that. Um, and so when you go through um, sort of, you know, whiteboarding, blue sky discovery processes, there's a lot of things that bubble up in terms of, you know, could we or we should do. Um, and so it's about building a process around capturing that information um, and making it um, clear that, you know, th those sort of features and those, those new things aren't going to be ignored um, and putting them in a place where, uh, the product manager or designer or stakeholder can can implement and, and put in their um, sort of feedback and, and their ultimate desires in terms of what they want the project to do. Um, so I tend to create a, something as simple as a Google Sheet, Smart Sheets, Excel Sheet, where people can just put in what it is that they want, new features, new ideas. Um, and then out of that, you can, you know, you, this basically is your potential future backlog. Um, to post MVP and you can prioritize this with the business and then bring it into your actual um, sort of backlog board, whether you use Jira, DevOps, shortcut, whatever. Um, but it is about constantly managing expectations, being clear in your communications, reminding them what the scope is and preventing the scope creep, but also providing an opportunity to absorb um, all that information and, and capture the scope creep. So the people that get really excited about certain things know that it's it's not off the table. It still can come. It's just not part of the initial MVP. What do you do to actually make sure that, because um, a lot of times there's a scope arrives, quote unquote, a little too late. Mm -hmm. When you do obviously draw a line, like at this point, we're not adding anything more, like this is it. We're actually working on getting this thing ready to a more of a shippable format. Mm -hmm. What do you do? How do you communicate to the stakeholders that, look, this is the, this is the date when we're not, unfortunately, can't go back and start adding more features because we're going to miss our shipping date? Right. Um, so there's a couple of things. I mean, if, if it is important for um, the customer that it hits that date, then that's when you have those communications and, and hopefully you've been really good up until that point and they're, they're very understanding and clear of, of what is going to be going out on that ship date. Um, so that's when you absorb it into your backlog and you can prioritize it. If it's very important, it can go out, you know, as the first feature after that MVP. Um, ultimately though, it is the customer's product. If it is um, it's super important that that feature is included in the MVP, then we have to have those conversations about what does the date look like? What does the scope look like? What does the cost look like? What do the timelines look like, right? All those different things, they move when you start to incorporate additional work that wasn't part of the initial MVP. So, yeah, I mean, I've, this happens all the time. Um, almost every single project. Um, yeah, today, we, I don't think I've ever worked on a project where there wasn't some form of scope creep. Um, we have a lot of thoughts around the shippable. I know Aram can speak for more than 24 hours about the, the dates <laughs> and then why, why they actually are very artificial. Uh, but uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to flip it back to, to you, Aram. How did we, what did we do to keep the reported project on the timeline? We defined the scope. They came to us. What did we do to any specific things we did to make sure that, hey, in X amount of days, weeks, month, we are going to come up with with the first version. Yeah, so I mean, we did take some shortcuts and I'll talk, you, talk to you about some things that we did. So one, once, once they created their, once we created the PRD, the product requirements document and we aligned on it and we went through that descoping exercise where we removed stuff that I was like, okay, that's nice to have. We don't need it in the, in the, in the MVP. Uh, we actually, instead of, and this is what I recommend to anybody creating any MVP these days. One is that, there's many, many design UI kits out there. Uh, the one that we used, for example, was the Google Material Design UI kit. It has everything there for you, and there's thousands of other UI kits um, for different purposes. And so second thing is that technology is a commodity these days. It's not really something that is hard to get uh, anymore. It's very accessible. 
Uh, there's many no code and low code solutions that you could use in order to build what you need in an MVP. Um, the goal of the MP, MVP, again, just to go back, is that you want to create something as quickly as possible to take it to your users to see if it's, you know, if it's solving their problem, right? And so for reported specifically, what we did was we we found a UI kit that had all the components in the UI library that we needed. So think of everything from like, okay, uh, buttons, hover states, accordions, uh, containers, whatnot, like it has everything typically that you need. And we actually just jump straight into, um, for the specific setting, we jumped straight into more polished designs because we had a UI kit that was already kind of high fidelity in, in its, uh, in its component library. And the, the app itself was very, very simple. It wasn't pretty. It did the job. And so that's another thing to consider is that the goal of what you're trying to achieve is that if you, how do I put this? What's the expression is if you are embarrassed by shipping your product in an MVP format, that's good. It should be embarrassing because if you start to overthink in terms of making it pretty, then you're not doing an MVP anymore. Um, and so by using just UI kit, we had a very simple interface. It was kind of black and white, minimal color, but it allowed the user to do the main functions, which was take a picture, take a video, uh, write captions, uh, write, you know, some information metadata in, in terms of what it is that you're seeing, adding in your, lo your location, where you're reporting the issue, whether that's automatic or manual, and then just putting submit and that's it. And through that information, we create a case, which was having an um, automated ID generated to it. And we use something called Google Firebase, which powered the entire backend for us. Google Firebase is a fantastic solution for startups or enterprises to use, where they do a lot of the heavy lifting, lifting for you in terms of databasing, running your backend and whatnot. Um, and so we saved a lot of time uh, architecturally and um, on the backend. And so all we had to do once the UI kit was approved or the UI was approved was then just build it. Uh, and we use something called React Native to build it. Um, luckily, the UI kit that we had was easily transferable to a React Native uh, component library, uh, which we repurposed. And very quickly, we just connected the front of the back end. And uh, yeah, we had a working prototype. That's really cool. That sounds pretty fast. Is um is uh the no code tools quite popular in uh, enterprise space, Fiona? Like, do do they actually do it or use it a lot, or do they like to go and actually go and code it? Um, I think it depends on what the product is, um, and also what sort of area that you're in. Um, if you're a dev team, then tend they tend to do build things because they want it in their tech stack. They want it in their environment. Um, but for some other things, if you're just testing out things, you would use vendors for that. Um, so it is quite often for enterprises to kind of build out things um, on no code or on something that's already pre-built for that purpose. Um, because there's um, a lot of technology out there that is built specifically for certain industries. Um, so if you can leverage that and test it, then great. If it works and speaks and, you know, communicates with your own systems, it's great mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, enterprises are getting better um, at um, building out products faster and, and um, less slick and not, not taking millions of dollars and years to complete. Um, just because the space is moving so fast, you don't have time to build on that. I mean, you've, you've got to be in an agile environment listen to your customers, build quickly, iterate quickly, add new features quickly, um, fail fast. Um, you know, all of those things are key to making you successful um, regardless of what in industry that you're in. Um, so if you have tools out there that you can leverage to test these things and, and to make things work for your users, absolutely. But it's also another big point we discussed is would you build it for internal use or do you build it for external use, right? Because there's mm -hmm. this tendency of if we build it for internal use, then it could look pretty not great. And we had this conversation quite a lot of times, like, oh, the internal tool, whatever, guys will, will use it. Like Apple's using iOS 6 application for, for a long time for their intern, for the Apple Store employees, which is like, looks quite ugly. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that finds even in um, solutions that you use for vendors, right? Um, so a vendor, um, like if you're using a vendor for a marketplace site or um, uh, a, some, some other sort of function, contesting, whatever, um, they often spend much more time investing in the front end for the users and that back end admin panel will stay the same for a decade. Um, so yeah, there's often a lot less effort that goes into things that are internally facing. Um, and for a couple of reasons, it's because it doesn't matter as much. Is it functional? Does it do the job? And also when you do major upgrades, oftentimes there's pushback from internal people or there's additional training. So as long as it functions and does the job, um, we tend to see a lot less investment on things that are internal facing rather than front facing, right? I just wanted to just add on something to the last question you had, Sergey, if you don't mind. Um, more and more, I'm seeing enterprises really start looking at no-code and low-code solutions, which is quite interesting because why does that happen? Well, one, I think uh, in, in industry, you know, it's costing more to get great people that could do what you need. And so that's, that's one factor in my opinion, but then also I think it leads to less um, red tape within an organization. So like whether you're an enterprise or whether you're a startup using as many kind of off the shelf solutions as possible to build out your MVPs is what I would always recommend because there's very likely if not a hundred percent, there's already something out there in the market that does what you need into integrate into your MVP. Um, so the other thing to consider in my opinion for enterprises is uh, when you are committing to an, to an MVP, you are testing a specific hypothesis or some sort of problem, whether or not that code is 100% transferable into your existing tech stack is not the objective. Because if you're That's trying right. to build an MVP, which is quick and dirty, you're solving for a specific purpose that you want to have. And so the more people who you have in terms of your internal technology team that are involved, then the more they want it to be within their own relevant tech stack, just for their own benefit. Um, and so the problem with that is that the problem, the product manager, whoever is doing and focusing on the MVP, then they got to deal with that requirement of having to integrate something later into their, into their tech stack, uh, once the MVP is, you know, successful. But I think the mindset that enterprises should have, um, is to be able to take the learnings that they get from the MVP, uh, more importantly, so that they can then think through some whether or not they need to take that into their existing tech stack uh, and whether or not what considerations they need to make because um, in some cases or not, MVPs are throwaways once they've solved their problem because then they once they've validated something, then they could actually build it up properly from a scalability standpoint. And this challenge with any no code or low code solution that I've come across, that I've spoken to customers around, whether it's a startup or an enterprise, is the scalability constraint. I know that the technology is improving in, the, in that realm, um, but it's still not at the point that you could really build out a very scalable product in that, you know, with that type of technology still. So that's why I'm of the opinion that still to this date, you will probably be need to refactor a lot of the code once you figure out what your MVP is, is successful or not. If you should decide you to bring it into that? your roadmap. Aram, should you even think about scalability when you're building MVP? Like, or no. is it, a, an, right? Like, cause I think like, if you try to do two objectives, we want to build an MVP and we want to scale it it's kind of like you're not you're you're not hitting either of those. No, I think you're just like overextending uh, yourself quite a bit, and so I would say no. Uh, I don't know; it's a debatable thing, but like, I don't think you should be going in and building an MVP. It's like, okay, how do we make this scalable from day one? Well, it's like, well, I don't think you can think through that. Uh, it's more about okay, like, what are we building this for, and like, is it going to be successful or not? What's What's the hypothesis we're testing around? What does success look like for this MVP? If you hit those factors and you hit those objectives, then yeah, okay, then start thinking about, okay, what do we do? We've hit, we've struck gold for whatever it is. And okay, now what do we do? Uh, can we repurpose it? Do we need to start from scratch? 
what are other things that maybe we could go back and test in that initial MVP with those target users before we really commit to, I think, building this out into like either a separate product or integrated into our existing product suite. We had a question from Fryer, a good question, Fryer. Like he's at, he asked, oh, could you use a non-functional, like how common is actually it's using a non-functional demo if it actually has within doable or achievable features? It will be, I mean, contextually, it will, be, it will be all based on the context, but like, could you actually have something that it's a demo, but doesn't really work? I could take that, I Fiona, or go ahead. I would say absolutely. Um, mm. You know, you're basically your MVP is trying to test whether or not you have customers that would be interested in, in the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Um, so if it's a clickable prototype that you can go through user testing and test features and to see if that's, you know, you get feedback and it's something that is desirable, um, then absolutely. You know, when we talk about MVP, this is something that would be, um, highly used in, in the case of a startup that's trying to get um, investment and things like that. You, they, you don't tend to build out a full functioning product. It's too expensive, it takes too long. You wanna test out your ideas quickly. Um, in an enterprise, this might be sort of your first round of MPP. This might be your internal MVP. So you build something that's clickable, um, that is like a prototype. Um, you get some feedback and then you can use that data to then make your case that, yes, this is something that we should build going forward. I wanted to clarify something. Um, yeah. What is the difference? Um, just like, to add on, I think some... Oh. There's a little bit of lag around, go ahead. Am I back? Sorry, guys. Yeah, connection. Just connection froze a little bit. Sorry. Go ahead, Sergey. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, you, you, you wanted to make a point. Go ahead, and make a point. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to say to Horair, um, to Horair, uh, some other uh, suggestion is it all def it all depends on who is your target audience that you're going to that MVP for. So, like as I mentioned earlier, you could get away by clicking a, clip a clickable prototype as a proof of concept that requires no code to be behind it. It could be something that you could put into an application um, that you could, you know, create trigger points around that's totally hot, um, hotspot based. And then you could share that with people and you could create uh, interactions of recordings with them that while they're going through it and, you know, giving you feedback in terms of some sort of like um, uh, unsatisfactions or some pains that they're going through. There are great, great products out there in the market, like usertesting.com, usabilityhub.com, where you could take your proof of concepts, you know, whether they're prototypes in something like Envision or in Figma or whatnot, and you could put them out on these type of platforms. And, you know, they even help you find uh, through different types of um, filter settings, the type of users that you want is to be presented in front of. And then you can make it accessible to them. And then you could ask them the questions when they actually start going through the product that you have that you want to answer. And all these things are recorded uh, sessions. And then based off of that, you could then take those learnings and reapply it uh, into your proof of concept and then send it back out to them and saying, hey, did I solve these things uh, in order to just quickly sanity check that you covered all the points? And that's there's nothing wrong with doing that. It just it really, again, comes down to who is your audience, where can you find them, and what is the expectations of them using your product? Does it need to be functional? Do, you, do they need to be able to put information to get something out of it as a result? Or can it be just a clickable representation visually of them going through the product and seeing what could be there? Okay, great, great point. Fiona, this one is for you. Uh, how do you, we talk about prototypes, we talk about MVPs. Is there a difference? Um, yes. So um, a prototype is more of a, it's, it's, it tests an idea, um, whereas an MVP tends to test a product. Um, so a prototype is a basic concept. Um, an MVP actually tests a feature. Um, so treating the basic concept as already proven. Um, the MVP is functional. It should be somewhat functional, whether it's an InDesign um, or um, an Envision 
piece, but it is something that can be used even in a limited way. Um, and a prototype is often more like the visual appearance of a product. Um, the prototype can be the foundation for the MVP, um, but they, there is a slightly there is slight difference between them. Generally, a prototype has no features, um, has limited functionality, little engineering or, or no engineering. An MVP traditionally does have a little bit more of that. It's, it's something that's more testable, more something that you could put in, t in front of a user and, and get feedback on them on, in terms of how it operates and, and, and how it works um, on their end. Aram, anything to add? No, I mean, I uh, uh, no comments. I think that's let's, that that is correct. <laughs> oh wow, well, great. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's go back to report it um, because we've uh, we've uh, we've uh, haven't talked about it for a while. So we've done all this work with report it. What was there? Like, what happened after the MVP? We shipped it. What um, what was? Did we get to their goal? And uh, what did they do after? Yeah, good question. So once we uh, finished the MVP, and so the finished deliverable there was taking the app into the app store uh, on Apple. Um, so going through the whole approval process, getting it out there. And then so once that was done, they were able to take that application and send and present it to the various organizations, as I said, the government bodies in their country, to the building managers that they work with, that they've we spoke to before, in terms of, hey, we have this idea that we spoke about before. Um, we actually built a, an MVP around it so you could see how it could look like from like a high level and, you know, actually use it and to see the functionality. And so now we want to, you know, ask you guys, how can we take this MVP and test it out in your, in your building? Um, and then, so then the conversations, you know, have been revolving around, okay, do we white label it for them? Do they, um, is it a subscription-based service that uh, they would use to get access to this product now in their organization? And so the MVP really helps them or other people to really show the value software can deliver to them. Uh, how can it make the experience of the citizens within a certain country better, that they feel like they accomplished uh, something by using the app. They have that feel good kind of like moment where like, okay, I did my part as a good citizen. I reported something that I thought was, was, uh, was off or, you know, um, broken uh, in a building. It's, you know, for the people who live in a building, it allows them to actually, properly submit something and track the case with their building uh, managers in terms of, okay, it's been received, it's being processed. Okay. Once it's complete, I know that I have contributed to making the lives of other people living in the building better. And so now that that has been defined and it's been articulated, now they're in some process of getting people to test it. Um, and seeing what the business model can look like with those organizations to warrant building a business around it once they identify what is the model uh, that they're going to be using. And then based off that, the commitment that you know these parties are going to be making, then we can go and build out additional features in order for us to do a, a more production release of that product. Uh, now, we had a question from Evdoxia. She asked it right when we started. And she, she asked, how do you, what do you do to make sure that MVP stays on budget? Fiona, this one is for you, especially if it's a large, you know, we have a lot of stakeholders, large company. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you would do to, um, to say, hey, like, this is the amount we agreed on or whatever you need to do to, to keep it uh, on what you agreed on cost-wise? Yeah, I, th I think this comes back to something that we touched on earlier in terms of um, defining the project, defining the scope, defining the timelines um, and, and resources. Those are all things that happen before you go into a build with a client. Um, so making sure that the PRD is signed off, that everybody understands what is included, what is going to be delivered, um, and also understanding the mission, the objective of this MEP. What is it supposed to solve? What are we testing? Um, what is it that we want to see, um, get feedback from customers and users as to whether it is desirable, is it something that they would want? Um, 
So as long as you have those things defined up front um, and you have, you know, there's not typically a huge amount of engineering. So those sorts of unknowns don't tend to creep as much into MVPs as when you're doing a full product build. Um, you can tend to keep these things in time um, on budget um, by just making sure that you have everything understood across all the stakeholders at the beginning. Um, it will involve, if you have multiple stakeholders and you have very passionate stakeholders, it will involve um, some, some tough conversations, um, but you are the product owner, the product manager, um, you own the product, um, you have put your name down that you know, you're gonna deliver X, Y, Z by such date. Um, and you just need to manage those stakeholders and, and give them the opportunity to um, you know, come up with additional ideas and, and vent and to, and to provide their insights um, and a way to document it, but not have it come into the project at that time. Yeah, uh, one other thing to add on that. I think if you want to uh, really well presented how to deal with external stakeholders, um, you know, in, in that kind of realm, but you should also be mindful of the understanding of your team in terms of what they're going to be doing. Um, so if you're building an MVP, your team probably looks like you, you know, you as a product manager, and then you need probably designers, UI, UX designers, and then engineers obviously to build any, any MVP. Um, so when you're going through the process, um, and this is tying back to the question about how do you stay within budget and time, it's really making sure that your own internal team is aligned with what we're committing to. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what that looks like is, um, having the engineering team involved in the early discovery conversations with those stakeholders, um, having engineering, uh, working with designers in terms of, uh, looking at each kind of feature or every kind of thing that designer comes, comes up with a, and the engineer being not scrutinous, but it's like, okay, this takes more time. Let's discuss how we can make it simpler. So presenting, having options. Um, and so once you kind of have that PRD, uh, then I would recommend having, the internal team go through that and uh, try to put together some estimations around some of the work effort for each of those kind of like features or functionality that you have. Then once the designs are done, it's constantly evaluating um, uh, um, the work that needs to be done in your sprints. So like, obviously you need to know how to groom sprints properly, uh, sorry, groom backlog properly, and then create sprints, knowing what the capacity is of that team that you're working with, you know, are they committed to other stuff uh, along with me, you know, in my team? If, if yes, then you need to factor that into your uh, weekly deliverables or your time that you're committing to those external stakeholders. Because if you're handcuffed, you can't be successful in delivering and shipping something on time on budget, right? Um, so that's often missed, I feel, because um, product managers don't know the full availability or capacity of their internal team that they have available to them. Is it a dedicated team? Is it like a partial team? Is that team working on other priorities? Um, that's, in my opinion, a challenge when it comes to like, uh, you know, working in an enterprise or any kind of larger setting, because you need that MVP team to have a focus and a specific um, commitment within the organization in order for them not to be handcuffed or roadblocked in terms of other priorities thrown their way. And so like, as a product owner, you need to kind of stand up a bit to anybody in the management space or the leadership team and saying, okay, you, if you're coming at me and you're saying that that person that I have on my team, my MVP team is going to get pulled out to do X, Y, Z, you know, for another department, another team, then like, let's be realistic. I can't hit these timelines and, you know, let's reassess. Um, and just being comfortable that you need to have those call tough conversations, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. That's tough in enterprise, especially if you're using resources that span projects or departments. Um, definitely difficult. Um, so, I mean, at Crowdlinker, that's something that we do really well. We, we have full allocations and we have allocation meetings to completely understand what everyone is, um, what their availability is and, and what they're going to be working on for a product. And that doesn't change. Um, so we have those knowns going into um, our product builds, but in enterprise, absolutely. 
you end up with meetings being canceled because they're double booked. Um, and so really um, before you go into your MVP, as Aram said, is understand what everyone's allocations are. If they say that they're gonna be 50%, then make sure you have those conversations with your designer, with your engineers that this week you're allocated to 50%, that's CX hours, right? Um, and just make sure that everybody understands um, the availability. Yeah, completely agree. Those internal um, issues are and creep up and sabotage your project quite quickly. Yeah, it's like a and, different form of scope creep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. We know a lot of companies who went with an agency and totally got burnt because like there are agencies who don't manage the allocation correctly or lots of other factors that mm -hmm. just don't, align and then um, the company relies on agency, they, they come up with something awful or they don't come up with anything. And that's really what I wanted to kind of wrap up this conversation with. Working with an agency, what do you need to be aware of? What do you need to think about if you are reaching out to make sure that you have the right expectation, but you can also ship whatever you have in mind? So like, what, what, do, you, what do you need to be aware of? Any points that would be helpful for people, either it's a large company, either it's a startup, they are considering building their MVP. What do you need to do to have an agency work with you correctly? And then also, how do you pick one? Yeah, good question. Uh, lots of learnings here over the years. So one is when you're speaking to an agency, um, first off is making sure that the team that you're speaking with pre-sales is hopefully the team that you're going to be working after sales. Uh, you know, it's going to be requesting, okay. Um, you know, I'm speaking to the salesperson. It's, you know, great. You know, you know, you're selling, you're pitching me something, but like, okay, who am I going to be working with? I want to know who these people are. I like to chat with them. I like to see, you know, how they're going to be like, because I'm going to be working with these people for the next weeks, months, who knows? Um, so that's one I always recommend. The second one is having transparency to the work. So having an understanding in terms of like, okay, uh, what is your process? How do you work? When do I need to get involved as a stakeholder? What is the frequency of our touch points? How transparent do I have access to the work that you're working on? Uh, and I can, can I participate in sprint planning? You know, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, some of our clients in the past, we, we had them in daily standups, um, but everybody's busy. So I think sprint planning is a good one, but at a minimum, we have weekly checkpoints with all of our, uh, with all of our clients, which helps us show a, what did we do in the sprint, uh, review the deliverables. We, we review what is the plan for the next sprint that we want to have and, you know, have them have the visibility in terms of what we're going to be doing and why we think it's important to do that. Now, the, obviously in an MVP, you know, in this specific realm, things change, priorities change, right? And so when you are doing an MVP, um, if you as the client are going to the market and you're speaking to those people, and things change along the way, we on the product team need to know what that is. So ideally, um, we're involved through that journey that you're going through. So we have access to those same customers that you're speaking to so that we have line of sight. And so that we're not just behind the scenes, just getting something come to us through like, you know, you chewed it and you gave it to us, having us um, be able to speak to them directly and you being okay with that. I think is important. Well, it's much as communication, you with a client, like us with a customer, it's the other way backwards too, right? Because you can't expect the customer-based product or MVP in this case to work well if you isolate your agency. Exactly, because you're just basically handcuffing us at that point because we're basically dependent on you being our source of truth instead of us being able to have access to your target base that we could speak to ourselves and ask those questions that you might've missed because you just might not know how to ask those certain questions. Um, I think at the end of the day, it just comes to being transparent, honest, uh, giving the visibility into uh, what we're working on, how we work, um, you know, having real-time access through Slack or whatnot um, to your agency so that you know, it feels like they're an extension of your team. And so I think the successful agencies that are out there are the ones that feel like you're, you're on the same team. We're on the same table, same side of the table. 
uh, you know, if you win, we win kind of thing. Um, and being true partners. And I think it's hard um, for a lot of agencies to not do that because they have their own processes. They like to only show a polished product instead of something work in progress. And I think successful ones are the ones that have many iterations along the way in each sprint where it's like, okay, let's get the feedback. Let's show you what we have. What are your thoughts? Are we on, are we missing something? Are we on track? And then just basically keeping the dialogue open all the time. Yeah. We will, we've all seen those pictures of how it started, how it's going, but you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a good idea to actually show, which, which I totally agree with Fiona from your experience working with enterprise folks, what did you learn learning with the agencies that you should consider? Keep in mind. Um, I think from an enterprise perspective, um, agencies can provide a whole wide range of solutions. Um, often when you're in a large enterprise, you have a core team that is working on a core product. So sometimes it's really hard to work on R&D or new features that are slightly different. Using an agency can, um, where they actually work in pure agile can get these things done very quickly compared to what you can in an enterprise and oftentimes um, at less cost. Um, so, I mean, it's something that a large enterprise should consider um, is working with agencies, whether it's to build a new type of website or um, you know, a new type of feature that they don't have experience in doing or, or they wanna test it out in something that is you know, a cheaper tech stack, something that is you know, um, um, already available to be built. So I think those are things that enterprises should consider um, in large organizations when looking at an agency um, is, you know, what is the job to be done? What is the timeline? Um, and agencies tend to be able to do them quite quickly. And I mean, we're experts in our area, right? So if there's a discovery phase, if there's an MVP phase, if there's, you know, if you need re user research, that's what we're experts in. And, and we hire people specifically um, to do those sorts of jobs. Any other parting messages you guys have around Fiona? We have three minutes left. We've covered uh, quite a large, vast ground, I would say. Not in depth, but as much as we could in an hour. You can't talk about everything in an hour. Anything else that could be helpful for people who are considering building an MVP, who are in the process of building an MVP? Something I have not asked you, but you wish I did. Um. Yeah, go ahead, Fiona. No, I'm reading the questions. <laughs> wow. um, the one thing I would say is uh, whether you're building a product internally in your organization or whether you know, you're part of an agency that's building it uh, for them, I think the part that oftentimes, as I mentioned before, is most, is most skipped or you know, passed on is just speaking to the customers. Like it's, it's such a simple thing to do, but so many failures around this that it's, uh, it's always surprising for me when this happens, because you building out a product, uh, you're, you're looking at from a perspective of like, okay, I see there's a need. I think this is the solution for it. And then you could go on a tangent building something out. Um, without it ever being presented to the actual paying customers. So you're making so many assumptions along the way, which could be quickly invalidated or validated by just speaking to those people. Um, it is really hard as Fiona mentioned and, Sir, and Sergey mentioned to have those conversations because you really got to get out of your comfort zone and sometimes ask those tough questions, you know, when they come up um, and, in my opinion, if you do that well and you cover your basis and you have access to these people, more importantly, that you've kind of like, you've really, you built a relationship with them along the way of trying to hear them out. You're listening to their problems. You built that relationship that you could easily go back to those people along the way and they could be your initial advocates, evangelists for your product because they would feel like they're part of the process. And then also uh, they're going to be the first people who use it. So like they would be the ones who are going to be most, um, they're going to be championing this product so that they could bring in other people 
uh, that they know in the industry uh, to spread the word. And that's priceless. Um, it's so much cheaper to solve a problem for those people that you speak to because they're most likely to refer to others instead of you having to go and spend a fortune trying to figure out how do I find these other people through advertising and other places that's all expensive these days. Um, but if you find a good group of people who you could really resonate with build that relationship with, and the most successful MPs I've come across are the ones where they really focus on that target demographic and they're constantly speaking to them. And this is because this could be a whole other webinar, but something called continuous discovery is something that I think leads to a much better product short-term and long-term. Um, and there's somebody really famous that uh, we interviewed who wrote a book on this. Her name is Teresa Torres that you could go and check out on our YouTube um, uh, a podcast recording I did with her where she talks about continuous discovery. And it's something that she wrote a book on that I think everybody should read and watch. We have two more questions that we should address before we wrap up. The first one, and this is either you, Fiona, or, or back to you, Ram. What do you, how do you know that, how do you make sure that the customers will buy your product when you built an MVP? Like you, let's say you have an MVP, how do you make sure that they will buy it? So not all MVPs are um, products that people are going to purchase, right? It could be a feature that's an add-on to an existing product. Um, so whether or not a customer will buy it, um, that isn't always the goal of an MVP. What you're trying to do is validate desirability, validate that it is something that the customer wants. So a customer, um, you might have an MVP of a product that solves a lot of problems for the customer, right? Make their life easier. They may still not purchase it. Um, so we're seeing this in a lot of industries, you know, like the, the media industry is trying to sell subscriptions to papers um, or online digital news um, sites and things like that. And even though it's, it's content that people want, not everyone's going to purchase it, right? So um, are there other revenue streams that can compensate for that? Is it, is it you know, digital ads to compensate for that because your user isn't going to purchase it? Um, so I think the MVP, I mean, you can ask your users at the end, which, would you pay for this? I mean, that's a yeah. valid question out of user testing um, and should be one, especially if you're starting with something that is a revenue driven concept. Um, but ultimately your MVP is just to validate whether or not um, what you're trying to produce is, is desired by your customers. Last question just came up, Cryer. Thank you for for that. I'll, uh, Aram, this is this one is for you. Uh, so okay. it's a good question, actually. So how do you, if our company we're building an MVP, our company is out of depth. Like for example, there is this specific area that our team doesn't know how to do. For example, um, I think he mentions printing conventions as an example. It's all relative. Like what do we do in this case? We are already in the process of building. So I'm assuming we're already in the process of building it? Yes. Okay. So uh, good question. Um, so I'll, let me see how I can answer that. So over over the last few years, we're, we built products in various industries and verticals, very agnostic approach on how to build product. Um, what we would typically do in discovery uh, is we would go and study what the competitor, the market has currently. And so most likely there's already something out there that exists. So if there's already some reference point, we would be looking at doing some sort of competitor analysis or some user flow analysis of their existing products to get our head around what that industry is like, what the products already in the industry look like. Um, and we get a lot of insight sometimes in terms of what's already out there. And it's not like we're stealing. It's more like we're getting ideas in terms of what are the things that they did. And then when we do our teardowns and we do our, our, our analysis, we look at what are the strengths and weaknesses. We look at the pros and cons of each of those competitors that are in that space uh, to see, in our opinion, from our you know, perspective, with us looking at it from a product-centric standpoint, okay, was that good? Was that bad? I mean, we obviously don't have access to that data that that company has, 
but we use our kind of best judgment with the experience that we have to see, okay, that was done well, this was missed, this company did this really well. Okay, we should factor that in. So there's lots of sources of inspiration uh, that you could get uh, of things already in the market. And then once you kind of tally that up, then it's going back and presenting that back to that target audience that you're building something for and saying, hey, we did this research. We found these people doing this well. We found these people doing this bad. Here are the, all the areas of improvement. Here is where innovation can happen. Um, and connecting those dots. And that's hard to do sometimes um, because you have to have the experience to get those insights. Now, once you do that, then you present that to the actual buying users and say, hey, uh, just going back to the question that you know Ser Sergey asked Fiona, and I wanted to jump in there with, yeah. just ultimately, okay, here's the problem that we, um, here's the solution that we've come up with uh, around this specific problem. Are you willing to pay for it? And in my opinion, the most successful MVPs that I've come across to date are the ones where they're like, yeah, you know what? If you can build this, I'll give you the money now what more validation could you possibly need in totally. terms of an MVP? If somebody can give you some sort of financial commitment to something, whether that could be like, okay, I'll give you credits. I'll, I'll buy some credits now for when you roll it out. I'll have it at 50% off for the next six months or whatever, you know, incentive you could create. But if you could get people to give cold, hard cash to something that you're providing them in that MVP that doesn't exist, that they think will solve, um, their problem or set of problems for them, you have a winner. 90% of the companies, in my opinion, actually never achieve this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I answered that question in two different ones. So I hope that's okay. That's good. That's the, the way you like it. <laughs> Efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona, anything else, anything to add? Um, no, no, I, I think that nailed it. Um, I think we just have one last question from Ali. Um, yes. Last question. Ali asked, uh, have you ever had a project or a customer where the discovery stage reveals that the problem to be solved is not only digital, so software, but also physical hardware and software? If that's what it is, then how would you develop an MVP in that scenario? So we so, start with the software and then there's a potential hardware problem that shows up while we're in the, in the middle of a project? It was Brian's question. Uh, okay. That's a tricky one. And to okay. be honest, over, you know, of the 60 products that we built, um, we tried dabbling in um, embedded software where we worked with something physical, like a device, a hardware of sorts. We, we don't have the expertise to do that. And so like, I never really successfully created something, you know, where it's, it led to that. So what I would say to Brian is, um, if that is something that you discover along the way through your discovery process, that your software now is evolving, your product is now evolving from software, mm -hmm. um, to something of like a hardware and software solution and your expertise is only in software, go and find a partner that you could work with. Uh, that you can um, screen, assess to see if they're a good fit to help you solve this problem. Um, and just being honest, yeah, I don't know if you're in the agency space or whatnot, but it's just being honest with your clients and saying, you know what, I don't have the expertise to solve this hardware issue that has now surfaced through discovery that I think it's warranted to go and find a partner that we could bring in to help us with this. I mean, it's, it's a tough one, but like, it's just, it's like, if, if something's outside of your depth, you could either go and find a partner or an individual as a freelancer to help you solve it, but don't take on more than you can chew because you're just going to set yourself up for failure. If you don't know anything about how to build physical hardware. Yeah. Cause it keep you outsource it, but like a lot of folks outsource it in China, like there are a lot, a ton of vendors who will, that will create whatever hardware product that you want from, from dogs, like plastic dogs to, uh, all sorts of, all sorts of crazy things like that, that that's what, and it's not that expensive. It, like then the batches on Alibaba are like 20 or 30 or 50 units, but at the same time, uh, what you're saying around, I think it comes down to the experience because there's, there's things that going to surface up 
that you didn't know. And then it becomes, if it's especially a client situation, it becomes very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, sorry, Brian, I hope, I hope that answered your question. Um, we've never successfully built something, uh, historically where it was a physical hardware product. That's not just our territory. Uh, but when we, when we ever did, we just brought in the right partner to help us with it. And we, um, we aligned in terms of what our role is in the project, what their role is. We would write the software. We would write any of the API endpoints that whatever is needed to interface with their embedded software that they would have on the hardware side, but they would be responsible for that in terms of a role and responsibility. And we would be responsible for the software side. And then we divided, we divided it out that way. Um, and like, I was just honest with the client at the time, like this is not something that we know really well. So I'd rather work with somebody who is an expert. So also a little bit of a discovery for, for us as an agency in a way, because we don't know, we, we don't know probably that partner. We'll probably try to find somebody who could be recommended, but it's also that relationship that hasn't been tested. So there will be more unknowns, which makes, uh, makes it harder. Yeah. It's a vetting process. You could build out it's through referrals or through your own, uh, research that you do through, you know, services like clutch.co or, you know, through doing your own online research that you could go, I would ideally narrow down from your research to five partners, reach out to them, understand their process, how they work, um, how they would fit into the existing product. Do they have the skill sets and expertise in order to take on a project like this? send them any of like the RFP or, you know, product requirement documents to them so they could review it, create some sort of like, um, uh, representation back to you in terms of how they would tackle it and just seeing what their thought process is in terms of their angle of approach to determine which one is putting kind of like their best thought into how they would work on this project and then just making a decision that way. Yeah. Well, there you guys have it. That's, that's the event. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. You will, if you join us live, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all the questions. If you are watching this recording, we'll have the links. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Aram. We'll have a link to his LinkedIn, uh, email, website, all those good things will be in show notes, description, wherever you're going to find this video recording. We have also product innovation show podcasts where we interview directors of product, product managers, chief product officers, really good stuff because a lot of the things that I, for example, brought up uh, and surfaced up in this conversation are from the guests that we spoke to and we will be speaking to in 2022. So check that out. We'll have it uh, in, uh, in the description somewhere. And thanks for joining. And we'll be back with another event. Awesome. Thank you very Thank you much, guys. everybody. Thank you thanks, for everyone. joining our webinar today.